continental aviation and engineering, in addition to being a leading producer of turbine engines for military application in jet target drones and training aircraft, has a well-recognized capability in power plant design and engineering. A film clip has been prepared which will illustrate highlights of the continental turbine story. Continental Toledo Manufacturing Plant, which has produced more than 9,000 small gas turbines since full-scale production began in 1954. Continental Toledo has 375,000 square feet of the latest in manufacturing machines and tools and facilities. includes modern machine tools, diversified tape controlled machines, and supporting equipment, including plating, anodizing, comparators, and balancers. Manufacturing skills of the highest order are matched with research and development facilities, both at Toledo and 70 miles north in Detroit, that are second to none for small gas turbine engine development. A total of 28 engine development test cells are exclusively available for testing gas turbine power plants. Full-scale jet engine testing takes place at sea level and at simulated altitudes up to 90,000 feet and Mach numbers to 2.0 plus. This altitude testing can simulate conditions of generator loading and fuel feeding exactly as they occur in aircraft operating at selected altitudes. Backing up the test facilities are extensive laboratories and an ultra-modern computer center that pulls all the research and development together. Continental has established an enviable record for on-time delivery for the past 10 years. And Toledo alone has a capacity of over 100 engines per month. But Continental turbine engine production capability was significantly increased in March 1968 when the production pipeline was lengthened from Toledo to Neosha, Missouri, which has 350,000 square feet of space providing turbine engine manufacturing and test capability. This plant has been previously used for production of rocket engines for NASA and Air Force programs. Continental Deosho produces engine gears for the J69 series gas turbine engines and added to the Toledo and Detroit facilities emphatically confirms Continental's rank as a major small turbine manufacturer in the country. Turbine engine overhaul and repair and manufacture of turbine engine spare parts are a major concern at Neosho and there's plenty of room for the expansion of Continental's manufacturing and test facilities that is certain to come. That's the way it is with Continental Aviation and Engineering, as it stays ahead of its turbine engine competition. But it takes a lot of blue sky thinking to help keep Continental's biggest customer, Uncle Sam, ahead of his competition. Let's examine the design philosophy behind the advanced technology of a new generation of continental turbines in the development stage. This is the core engine, the basic unit of the continental turbine family. Note that our core engine features axial and centrifugal compressors, an annular combustor, and axial turbines, all carefully selected to form a versatile, low-cost design adaptable to many uses. We shall now examine some of these applications. When we add a free turbine to the core engine, we have the power section of an auxiliary power unit for an advanced fighter. The output drive is to the rear. Now, going back to the core engine, here's another ingenious plan for Continental's new generation of turbine power. The core engine has been supercharged by the airflow from an outer spool compressor. The supercharging outer spool compressor is scaled up from the first three stages of the core compressor. Note the potential of the free turbine, forward or rear drive output shaft. At an increased horsepower rating, this engine is the power section of the auxiliary power unit 
for an advanced bomber or transport plane. When twanged through a power-sharing gearbox, this engine is the propulsion unit for an advanced strike helicopter or for a transport chopper. Turboprop configurations of equivalent horsepower could also result from this basic engine. Now, evolving from the same core engine, we turn to a family of turbofans. In this example, an outer spool of a single-stage fan and a two-stage turbine has been added to our foundation engine. This combination could furnish propulsion for a volume-restricted vehicle, such as the air cab, or propulsion for a small target or decoy drone. The fundamental versatility of the core engine is once again apparent when we add a high-pressure ratio, high-bypass outer spool, which results in an excellent propulsion system for an advanced, long-range missile capable of flying at variable altitudes and speeds. In this frame of thinking, range is maximized by trading fuel volume against several factors, namely engine-specific fuel consumption, engine size, and airflow rate, as it affects inlet and exhaust size. Continental Aviation and Engineering has compiled an excellent track record while turning out thousands of turbine engines for the U.S. government, for twin jet trainers, and for subsonic and supersonic drones. But even better turbine propulsion systems are in the making. New, high-performance, high thrust-to-weight high thrust and thrust-to-volume ratio turbine engines are in the development stage, with both thrust and shaft outputs available. Brian's aerospace system's capability and its record of achievements in electronic and space systems forms the nucleus of its current activities. Based on an unusual 20-year record of achievement, Ryan is the nation's foremost producer of pilotless aircraft, both subsonic and supersonic. The following film clip will show some of Ryan's accomplishments in this field. To provide a flexible and realistic simulation of known threats. That is the mission of the Ryan Fire Bee target system. This challenging realism has enabled the Fire Bee to support the development and evaluation of increasingly sophisticated Air Force missile weapon systems since 1949. For target operations, Ryan personnel provide complete support. Launch remote control and tracking, recovery and refurbishment, pre-flight preparation and relaunch are accomplished by this highly specialized team of target experts. An outstanding record of efficiency and target reliability has been achieved in support of Air Force weapon evaluation programs. To determine weapon system effectiveness, 
to validate its effectiveness in the hands of the user in an operational environment, and to provide realistic training to maintain air crew efficiency. These are the primary requirements of a weapon system evaluation program. To accomplish these goals, an effective target responsive to these needs is essential. Firebee meets these needs. As an effective participant in weapon system evaluation, Firebee has a demonstrated flexibility in simulating various threats in the environment. Radar image size of the Firebee is varied electronically with a traveling wave cube. Even greater authenticity of the threat simulation can be achieved by using recent Ryan augmentation improvements. By creating an omnidirectional radar reflectivity coverage around the target, image size can be held constant, regardless of the attitude of the Firebee or that of the attacking aircraft. After a missile has been fired, a measurement of its accuracy must be obtained for the data collection and analysis function of the weapon system evaluation. This is made possible by the scoring systems carried in Firebee. MATS, Multiple Airborne Trajectory Tracking System, and BIDOPS, by Doppler. Ryan can now provide practically error-free scoring from missile point of aim by co-locating scoring antennas with those of the traveling wave tube. Infrared signatures are augmented by flares or other heat sources. By similarly locating scoring antennas at the flare attach points, precise scores can be obtained for heat-seeking weapon systems. The Firebee uses a radar low-altitude control system, RALAX, for low-altitude penetration simulation. With this system, Firebee can fly as low as 50 feet over water and 100 feet over flat land areas. An automatic formation flight control system is in development, which will permit the Firebee to make multiple target presentations. Where maneuverability is a mandatory requirement of a weapon system evaluation, Firebee uses an increased maneuverability kit, IMK, which gives the target a constant altitude turn capability of up to 6 Gs. An improved version of this system will enable Firebee to execute high G climbing or diving course reversals. In addition to its other capabilities, Firebee can be equipped for ECM missions to dispense chaff, or to provide electronic noise jamming and deception techniques. Ryan has developed and flight tested a new and even more challenging version of the Firebee, the supersonic Firebee 2, or BQM 34E. Firebee 2 has the capability to be even more responsive to the advances in current weapon systems and to satisfy requirements for future weapon programs. The BQM-34E flies in a clean configuration at Mach 1.1 at altitudes as low as 100 feet, Mach 1.8 up to 50,000 feet, and Mach 1.5 above 60,000 feet. This new target has a maneuvering capability of 5 Gs up to 20,000 feet and 2 to 3 Gs at higher altitudes. For extended range time at subsonic speeds, 400 pounds of fuel is carried in a jettisonable external fuel tank. For subsonic missions, the BQM-34E flies at Mach 0.9. On tank jettison, the target translates to supersonic speeds relying on its internal fuel load of 278 pounds. Fire B-2 can be air launch or ground launch. It is recovered using the same two-stage parachute system employed in the subsonic BQM-34A and retrieved by helicopter or boat. Or recovery and retrieval may be accomplished in a single operation using the mid-air retrieval system, MARS. Utilizing a specially equipped helicopter, mid-air pickup uses a modified parachute system in Fire B-2, which allows the helo to pass over and engage a drogue chute. This takes the weight of the target on a load line and simultaneously disengages the main chute from the drone. The helo then winches the target up to a safe carry position for return to base. 
Mars permits a quick turnaround of the target for relaunch. Air Force evaluation programs for weapon systems play a vital part in our nation's security. Ryan Aeronautical Company has served the Air Force for the past 20 years by providing realistic target systems to support these programs. This, then, is Ryan's commitment to continue our dedication to purpose and to retain our flexibility in the face of constantly changing requirements, thus maintaining the Fire B target system as a vital element in preparing the defenses of the nation. In the area of electronic and space systems, Ryan has made a significant contribution. One of its most recent accomplishments was the development of electronic systems for the Apollo mission. This application is presented in the following film clip. Helping the Apollo lunar module land softly on the moon is Orion landing radar system. The radar antenna is positioned on the bottom of the descent stage of the lunar module, and the radar's electronics that process the radar's measurements are inside the descent stage. These measurements are of the speed of the spacecraft, how fast it's going forward and how fast it's going down, and of the spacecraft's altitude, how high it is above the moon. Radar energy is transmitted and received in narrow beams. The radar echoes come back from the surface of the moon. A shift in the radar frequency, called a Doppler shift, is measured to tell the velocity. Made of magnesium, the antenna is protected from extremes of temperature by a reflective coat of aluminum. Radar information is displayed on the astronaut's control panel and is fed to the guidance and navigation computers. Now, this is how the Ryan radar works in the moon landing. Seven minutes, the final crucial minutes in the Apollo program to land American astronauts safely on the moon. And aiding the lunar module in its descent is a landing radar system designed and built by Ryan Aeronautical Company of San Diego, California. Powered descent begins at about 50,000 feet. In the next few minutes, the descent engine will slow the spacecraft from its present speed of more than 3,700 miles per hour to a safe, radar-controlled three miles per hour at touchdown. Shortly after ignition, the landing radar is turned on and given a 30-second warm-up. Then, at about 45,000 feet, the astronauts initiate a yaw maneuver, turning the lunar module over with the viewing port face up. In this position, the landing radar beams are directed at the lunar surface, and the radar altimeter locks on. Forward speed, about 2,700 miles per hour. Speed of descent, about 37 miles per hour. Seven minutes to touchdown. Some 90 seconds later, the lunar module has dropped to about 39,500 feet. At this point, the radar altimeter, having direct lunar contact, begins to update the inertial guidance system, which until now has served as the astronaut's principal sensor. The craft is now at 24,000 feet, 950 miles per hour, four and a half minutes from landing. At about 59 degrees off vertical, the most forward-looking of the three velocity sensor beams strikes the lunar surface and locks on. Now the landing radar is serving as the astronaut's primary sensor in controlling the spacecraft's rate of descent. It has become their electronic eyes. Now, automatically, it updates the inertial equipment, displays altitude, rate, and velocity, and also automatically stabilizes the spacecraft during its descent. Radar reliability is a must. Near 7,000 feet, the lunar module reaches high gate, a critical point in the trajectory. Velocity is reduced enough to bring the craft still closer to the lunar vertical. Shortly after high gate, the landing radar switches automatically from the descent position to the hover position. And now the astronauts have their first low-altitude look at their landing site. 
They have now pitched forward to about 47 degrees and are at an altitude of about 6,800 feet. 5,000 feet, two and a half minutes. 3,200 feet, two minutes. Forward speed slows to about 125 miles per hour as they pass the 2,000 foot mark. Descent rate is about 37 miles per hour. One thousand feet, eighty seconds. Five hundred feet of altitude, low gait. The astronauts are crossing the lunar surface now at forty-five miles per hour. Descent rate slows to about fifteen feet per second. Sixty seconds from touchdown. At twenty-five seconds, they pass the two hundred foot mark. Gradually, spacecraft speed is reduced until at about 110 feet, descent rate drops to three feet per second. During this period, the astronauts take manual control of the lunar module. Using precise low altitude measurements of their landing radar to maintain their desired descent rate, the two-man lunar module continues to settle toward the moon. The astronauts assess their landing site, and if necessary, maneuver laterally by firing the reaction control jet. The best possible site is selected. The astronauts, cushioned by rocket power, guided by radar eyes, slowly, slowly, and touch down. The soft landing, high point in man's greatest adventure.